Welcome to Kicking It Local, the podcast all about the football community right here in South Australia. I'm your host, Johnny Kekko, and today I am joined by a WNPL player who currently plays for West Adelaide and has just won the WNPL WSL Cup and also the Premiership in the WNPL as well for 2022 and hoping to get the treble very, very soon with the championship on the line. I am joined by Olivia Bramley. Thank you so much for joining me. No worries. Thanks for having me. It's something new for me as well. And yeah, just kind of excited to hear your questions and yeah, share my stories, I guess, and add to our community. <laughs> yeah, no, it's going to be good. Um, I've had your, obviously your captain, um, Nicole yeah, Tilly on here yeah. before. She loves uh, loves talking on the mic, doesn't she? Yeah, she's <laughs> always like, oh, I guess, cover girl. And like, yeah, she speaks so well as a captain, I don't know, shows yeah. when you're a leader. So I, but yeah, she's she's good on those things. So. Absolutely. And she's also got her own podcast as well, Kick yeah. Like a Girl. So. Yeah, that's just starting. Um, I've got to admit, actually, sorry, Tills, but I've oh. just listened to one so far, which is um, the Rachel Quigley edition. So yep. it was great as well, like Rachel being a teammate, just hearing yep. her story was like pretty special. So. I've actually got to give a shout out to Rachel as well, because she was meant to be on this podcast as well. And she's uh, called yeah, you in last she minute. She wrote me in. It was like a tag team thing. So... Um, I'm sure her story is much better than mine, but we'll see how we go today. <laughs> no, well, it's, I'm looking forward to talking about your story as well. And also your name, Bramley. Yeah. I didn't know this before, but there's a type of apple called a Bramley apple. Yeah. So growing up, I'd like, hear my mum and dad on the phone, like with phone call conversations and be like, yeah, Bramley is in the apple. So <laughs> it's a well-known kind of thing in the England comes where all the Bramley apple sauce is made from. I don't know if I'm naive or not, but I've never heard of a Bramley apple here in Australia. It must be a UK style of uh, yeah. apple. <laughs> UK cooking style, quite yep. green. Don't know if my ancestors were maybe um, apple farmers or what. But, um, they went for the apple sauce, not the cider. So <laughs> okay, <laughs> apple yeah. sauce, nice. What do you have apple sauce with? The it's good with um, pork and stuff like this. Yeah, yeah. so I'm veggie, but I used to just have it like put it in my Yorkshire puddings oh, again, yeah. an English Yorkshire pudding type thing. But yeah, just. Put it with anything, a bit like cranberry sauce. Nice. Well, if the Bramley apple reference with uh, all that and uh, also your accent doesn't yep. give it away, you're from the UK. Yep. So now you're living in South Australia, which is, uh, you've only been here for a couple of years now? Yep. So I moved here mid-pandemic, pretty yep. crazy tra- times. Mm. Actually escaped some of that real bad lockdown in the UK, which is kind of <laughs> nice coming into the SA summer. Um, yep. But yeah. Because- was that intentional or just very good timing on your, on um, your behalf? Would have been sooner if it wasn't for the early days of the pandemic when the borders were completely shut. Um, yeah, my partner's a dual citizen, so we actually got like an exemption to travel. But it was when the, I guess, the, the down peak and everyone oh. thought it was disappearing and COVID was going. So we just got in at the right time and then all kicked off again. So Well, that's good to see that you're <laughs> enjoying time your time here in, uh, in South Australia. But uh, I want to talk about your football career in, uh, in the UK first because... It's obviously uh, a lot further ahead in the professional realm mm. compared to what it is here in South Australia, in Australia. But uh, you you did your uh, hard yards over there in the local leagues. Mm. What was it like uh, trying to break through in the, in the UK in the women's football? Yeah, I guess like my generation, so I'm like 24 now. Um, it's like a weird kind of age group. So it's still, I guess, knocks on the door of when there wasn't much going around. Yep. Uh, women's football wasn't as big. There was a lack of professionalism at the time, but still hitting on the generation where it really was becoming to mm. become a professional. Um, so yeah, I started on a local grassroots team at Obi and Wixton. Um, I think where I come from, most people start there. Um, real good like, family grassroots club. Um, I think it's where I developed my love for the game, like just pure passion and just playing for the love. Um, and then I, I trialed for a couple of years at the academy. So Leicester's yep. Centre of Excellence and just always got through to the first stage and second stage just didn't quite ever make the cut. And then I was playing one Sunday just for Obi Wixson and a scout came. Um, so I got my shot through, yeah, being watched kind of in my oh, gameplay. Wow. Yeah. What, um, what was that experience like when you got... Uh, obviously watched and they said that they liked what they saw. Yeah, I didn't quite like, obviously imagine like, this is something I was like, my goal, my aim, and I didn't quite believe it on that time. I was like, oh my God, I'm getting invited to the academy and wow, like this is so cool. Obviously like really nervous, but yeah, just didn't believe it. I was like, how has someone watched me play? And they're the one they've picked out in a whole team of, you know, at the time, like 22 people on the pitch. Um, So yeah, I went, had a couple of weeks and yeah, they gave me a contract um, so I played there for the rest of that season and the following year before the age is like cut off at under 17. So until that point and then went to women's football. 
So what happened once you got uh, went into women's football? What was that like um, after that to to continue your career? Yeah, so I got um, one of the academy coaches from the junior. She, um, Jenny Sugarman, um, awesome coach. Just shouting her out actually in the UK. Um, yeah, she just said like, look, why didn't you come to Loughborough? We were they just got promoted that year into the English um, WNPL, so tier three in England. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure, like. Big, um, and I'd always played a bit of wimp, like open age at grassroots, like for my old, yep. my old club on the side of it. So, kind of had that, yeah, adult football in me, but it was definitely a difference and a step up. And I think I was what 16, 17 at the time, and you're playing with people who have heaps of experience. So it toughens you up. You learn quickly, but I think yeah, just a bit of buying my time, yeah, learning from those around me, and just yeah, that willingness to want to improve every week is kind of what got me through. Yeah, well, you talk about that you're in the third division there, but what was, like, comparing it to now in the, in Adelaide, we've got the WNPL, then we've got the uh, A-League as the next level mm. up. No, uh, nowhere in between yet, because you can't get up into the uh, A-League women just yet, but what's it like over there, the uh, the quality okay. between the standards between where you w- were playing and in the top league? Yeah, it's, it's a kind of probably a tough one, and I reckon it probably depends interstate here as well, but I'd say... The depth here is probably what's different. So I, there's more depth in the UK, which you can imagine that like, there's mm. heaps more pool of players. Um, and now with the professionals, professionalization of that women's league, like the WSL filtering down, you are seeing that trickle effect of, you know, top players still playing at tier three now. So yeah, I'd say the depth and it's getting more competitive here. You know, you, when you've got the A league girls joining the league and even some of the ones with experience, like, there are really talented players in the league, but I'd say across the board, um, that's where it's a little bit different, yeah. Yeah, well, we're lucky because our local league is a different time to the A-League women, yeah. so a lot of those players would come filter down into the in the off-season, come down and play WNPL. Yeah, exactly. Whereas you wouldn't have that over there in in the uh, in the UK. Yeah, no, so, so yeah, it's only, like I said, in the past couple of years that you probably see, yeah, some Tier 2, Tier mm. 1 players maybe dropping down to Tier 3, just like I said, because... There's more international signings as well. So that changes the spots available. Um, whereas here, yeah, you kind of get those girls that really do experience that professional level to still like some of my teammates who yeah. I learn from and just love playing with. So, yeah. Did you um, ever want to go higher up in, in the women's football over there? Or was it, was it something, was it difficult to try and break through? Um, I think, yeah, as a kid, I definitely did. Like, I think every, I don't know how everyone else was, but every young kid I wanted to play for England once upon a time. I think you do get a bit of reality. Like, I'm a big dreamer and I just think mindset is everything. So if I put my mind to something, I will get there. Yep. Um, but also, yeah, like a bit of realism. And like I said, the way, when they make WSL full-time professional and you know, you're training every day, you're getting the resources, you get the support, you're obviously going to accelerate in your skill level. It doesn't matter how much you probably try even like, you know, you've got to manage a job, you've got to manage all these other things. So I think a bit of reality there. Um, I'd like to probably go back to UK, maybe step up tier two would be, yeah, I think like a realistic yep. goal for me. Um, but definitely over here, um, I see, yeah, that step up more achievable. Um, and yeah, I've got Although I'm getting a bit on the older side, maybe it's 24 in the football world, but I think my peak is still to come um, in the next three, four, five years. So yeah, got my eyes set. So we'll see. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully so, because uh, it would be good to see um, some more local talent in our local WNPL making their way up into the A-League. Yeah. And someone we saw and uh, took her opportunity at her first chance at LA United, Fiona Watts. Mm. She went into playing for LA United and she did an amazing job in that season uh in 2021 mm-hmm. and now she's playing overseas yeah incredible so not only did you play with her here at fulham united when you made your way to adelaide but you did play uh, against her over yeah. in the uk as well yeah so yeah fiona's from where i'm from locally as well i don't know if she actually ever played for obin wixton you might have to ask her that one but um <laughs> yeah so she again just a little bit older than me so it kind yep. of never was in the same academy years or whatever and then yeah, like I said, in uni, you kind of travel away for university in the UK. So she moved up north, but she was actually playing for Leicester Women throughout that time as well. And I was elsewhere. And then, yeah, so in the UK, you have loads of different cups, more than just one cup here, like you do here. So we have what's called the County Cup, which is Leicestershire. So it was like Leicester Women versus Loughborough Foxes. So I'm pretty sure we tried to map out. We think she was, yeah, maybe in that team yeah. at the time. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, it's a small world. <laughs> it is a small world as well. So then you made your way to Adelaide. 
So what was the reason behind coming to LA? Was it to work? Was it for family? Like what was the the, the background behind yeah, it? Yeah, mixed bag really. So I'd spent some time here in 2018, part of my university degree. So I worked at Vic Union, the Western Bulldogs. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. I got an internship within that. Um, and then just loved it, loved the culture, like loved the sunshine. Like, I always wait for my tan in the summer. Um, <laughs> so yeah, just really like enjoyed the culture. And like I said, my partner's a dual citizen, so their family's over here so kind of fell in place that way and then yeah few opportunities from like being here before that I thought I could expand on yeah and now do a PhD so committed to studying here as well um and yeah different football challenge I think sometimes it's really good to put yourself out your side your comfort zone but also just get fresh perspectives like different coaches you know if you've grown as a player and you just you want to really like show yourself or come into yourself i think sometimes a change of scenery is good as well absolutely but let's yeah. just quickly focus on the uh, the bit about the sun tanning and stuff like that <laughs> what's a, what was the difference like coming here and having oh. our warm summers because obviously in the uk you wouldn't be expect uh wouldn't be experienced the, the summers that we experience here yeah no until this year i think i think my family right now back <laughs> home are living up in the 35 degrees um probably not a good reflection on climate change yeah. but um yeah, it's, it was, like I said, I love the sun and I used to um, wait out for my two-week family holidays every year to get the sun. So it was quite nice. Like just, I think for me, the sunshine lifts my mood. So yeah, turning same. up to training is 10 times easier and you don't have as many layers and you're not getting drenched or playing in the snow and having games called off because, you know, your pitches are flooded. Um, so yeah, it's quite nice. So you really. must love the uh, the drinks breaks uh, halfway through each half. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, fortunately for us, obviously at the moment yeah. WMPL it's not that warm, but yeah, pre season. Yeah, the pre season yeah. and sometimes the uh, depending. Normally this um, time of year it's a bit getting a bit warmer, warm, but yeah, yeah, like the cup final Sunday, first half sun yep. comes out. Just was not ready for that. Um, didn't quite have enough hydrolytes and electrolytes on me to replenish, but um, yeah, I'm hoping maybe it just holds off for the grand final period. Yeah, let's hopefully. <laughs> I reckon you might just be that still. Um, but with that, you love relaxing in the sun. But how have you found playing in, or mainly training? Because earlier in the season is training in this in mm. the uh, in the heat. <clears throat> how do you, how do you find that? Yeah, I think initially coming over, it's probably harder to adapt. Like you know, you definitely sweat a lot more, and <laughs> you it's you know it almost feels higher intensity because yeah. you're having to um, work through the heat as well. But I definitely think yeah, you quickly adapt, and I think. I don't know if it was a back of COVID. Um, hadn't I really had a full season throughout 2020. Like um, my university season at books got cancelled. You know, the UK league got cancelled. So I'd like just ran all through lockdowns, like running, running, like running half marathons, going for 10Ks and that just became normal. So I became a bit of a, I guess, a runner through that period because there's nothing else to do. Um, and then I think, yeah, I just had the hunger to get yeah. back into football. Like I said, really come and try and establish myself in Australia and, what kind of football I wanted to be. So I think that in the back of my mind when you're pushing through the heat, yeah, it really helped. And yep. then you adapt quite quickly and then, yeah, I just focus on the tan. And <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, if you do play in the, uh, the A-League women, then you will obviously need to get yeah. used to playing in 40 degree heat. Yeah, exactly. So get some yeah early runs in and um, nice fitness training and high intensity yeah. trainings ahead of the season. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think you quickly adapt. Yeah. So when you were playing at Fulham United with obviously Fiona Wirtz was there. I've spoken to the president of the club, Arthur Labrosciano, and he puts an emphasis on how he focused on uh, having a women's team if he's not going to treat them the same as what they're treated with, like the men. How did you find your time being at, at uh, Fulham United? Yeah, like to be fair, I loved, I loved Fulham, like such a good group of girls. Like I have a real good close relationship with a lot of them still. Yeah. Um, probably, yeah, some of my real supportive network here. Um, in SA and like some of them came to the finals and the weekend to support me and and obviously Westies as well but yeah. um yeah it was great like you know there's some challenges and the results we got but as a defender as well I wasn't <laughs> I loved him 90 minutes of defending some weeks um <laughs> and yeah I think um there's a lot of people that wanted to really drive the club and drive the women's program I still think there's a long way to go mm. um you know I think there's probably a lot more that could be put into the women's program to be honest um and wherever how that goes in the future I'm not sure what that looks like for them um but yeah in terms of the playing group um you know Yubi was our coach he's a great guy um he's really supportive of like the women's game in general so it was really nice to have him on board um and then yeah Romeo Vela he was like our kind of Fulham dad yep. who was like which was you know coming new into SA felt 
really supported by him. Yeah. Um, and there's like, yeah, big family kind of feel around it. And there's like Millsy is like <laughs> one of the juniors. She's just like biggest fan girl ever. So yeah, nice family um, feel to the club. And yeah, warm welcome coming from the UK. And I think it really kickstarted my journey here. Yeah, that's good because I love those type of clubs where it's the like the, the Italian background or the Greek background, Serbian mm. background. It's all different cultures there. So did you notice the culture down at um, Fulham United when you were there? Um, yeah, like I said, like just quite a bit of a, I guess, yeah. a big back yeah. in. Um, and yeah, I, I guess I didn't see it across the whole club as much. I think there's sometimes not as connected link between the men as yeah. men and women as maybe other people would like. But yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, just a family vibe, really. Yeah. yeah. But uh, you went ended up moving to Melbourne, mm-hmm. um, where you got to uh, play a bit for South Melbourne. Yeah. So they're a very well-known team in the men's field with the uh, NSL back in the day. Mm. And they're a massive club. Um, mm. What was it like to play for a club like that? Yeah, it was awesome. Like you said, like big club, big reputation. I think the men's have just won their premiers. Mm. So they were all relegation <laughs> last year, now the premiers. So credit to the, to the boys at South. Um, but yeah, I, I like I said, when I was here in 2018, a part of my placement internship year, I did a bit of training with South. So I had a had a knowledge of what South were about and um, I just reached out, um, yeah, knowing I was going to be moving to Melbourne. Yep. Um, kind of liked what the club was about, thought it'd be a good challenge for me. Um, things were a big transitional the year this year for the women, actually. Um, but again, so fortunate to walk, walk into a team where the playing group was incredible, like, Again, like I said, now I chat to some of the girls still because they're just such good people who just want to learn and, um, yeah, and really challenge each other. And like I said, being in Melbourne, different types of players, different intensity, mm. um, which is pretty good to experience. We look here in Adelaide, we've got some amazing A-League women players who play in the um, WNPL mm. here in South Australia. Is it similar over there in Victoria? Um, yeah, probably, I'd say probably a step up. But again, yeah. in the sense... Of maybe depth so kind of how the uk is a bit more there's a bit more depth there so yeah. yeah it's more competitive across the board in victoria um but that doesn't say yeah there's heaps of talent here in sa and it's interesting that you see a lot of players like migrate to other states so um like you know ella tonkin is in sydney um emily condon went to sydney cote sydney yeah um or new south Wales, should i say um and a few people, yeah, in Victoria. So you kind of want people to stay around so, you know, we can grow the league in SA as well. But, yeah, I think Victoria and New South Wales probably steal it. Yeah. Steal the show at the moment, so. Oh, they do all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but it's good to have you back here in uh, in Adelaide. Now, you're playing for West Adelaide. Yeah, um, And it's been very uh, successful during your, your time there. You've already won the Premiership and the Cup. Cup. Yeah, incredible. So, like, yeah, last year, I guess... The finals weekend at Fulham, we were playing relegation. So we beat Bacala to stay in the league. And then this year, it's like the opposite. I've still got a final series as such. And it's, yeah, the other end of the ladder. So it's been awesome to experience that. And I think that's absolutely credit to the club in the way they support the women's program. Yep. There's a lot of dedicated people behind the scenes, like Rachel, Kirsty, and Tracy um, herself as our head coach, like just driving that forward. And then the playing group themselves as good people, lot of talent in our team um and then when you just bring that all together i just feel like it's just yeah a recipe for success like <laughs> it's overwhelming as a player especially as a defender when i sit there and there's games and i just watch the girls ahead of me and you know rachel's doing her thing on her chest and em's making runs down the line and i'm just have to two step on the halfway line <laughs> <laughs> well i was privileged enough to be at the game watching right on the pitch so um pitch side and just seeing the the way you guys were playing with each other and the way you guys react, um, the way you guys act with, within the core, core group as well, it seems like you guys are at next level, not just as a, uh, teammates, but also it seems like there's a bit of a friendship going on mm. between the club as well. Yeah, absolutely. We, I don't think it's like, probably never been in a team where everyone has had the same vision and the same level of wit in it for the team. There's yeah. not one individual in our team that just wants the glory or it's just about them. It's genuinely about all the success. We work for each other. We work for the badge. We work for our coach. So that I think we all back what Tracy does in that sense as well. Um, and it just shows, yeah, the way we celebrate. There's, you know, we even look at Annie back in her goal. She didn't always <laughs> join when, when we're scoring so many. But yeah, she's there. And Rachel taking her celebrations at the weekend over to the bench, like every score every player in our squad, like even through the re- the reserves, like we are, yeah, just one. And we just want to kind of not just be good footballers, but really change the game and 
we're about more than the results, yeah. you know? We're about the women's game. Um, we're about inspiring the next generation and I think that's really special. I think you are doing a very good job of that as well because the way you guys play is, is incredible and I love the way you guys were celebrating as well. You see how much it actually meant to you, especially being 1-0 down at the start yeah. um, to LA City, but managing to come back and to, to take it the way you did was a very good game to watch. Yeah, it's interesting like when we do come up, we have the bigger games because, you know, there's times maybe in the league where we aren't as challenged and it's, you know, some of the things come off a little bit easier maybe and so then when we come to the game it's almost that shock to the system um but I think throughout the season you know we had a, a draw against Salisbury mm. a few weeks ago now but I think that again just keeping us on our toes and then a few other games where yeah we've had to come back so we've almost experienced it all and um I think in the earlier rounds I think I yeah I didn't play it but um against Adelaide City the first time I think they I can't remember the score, but yeah, a bit of a heavy loss there. So I think we've learned a lot from some micro failures as such. And yep. um, so now, yeah, I don't think going one nil down is, you know, some teams can think that's a, a downhill road, but for us, that's, you know, just another thing. We'll, we'll score two, we'll score three kind of thing. So <laughs> yep. yeah, there's, there's just nowhere. I just feel like we're an unstoppable kind of group <laughs> at the moment. And it's awesome. Yeah. Now the celebration, uh, on the field was amazing to watch and uh, you guys gave me a lot to film as well because I was uh, on the boundary line filming for the live broadcast. Yeah. So every time you guys celebrated on the bench, it was great for me because I got some really good shots. <laughs> yeah. But unfortunately, uh, I haven't seen anything on social media yet, but I've heard whispers <laughs> that there were some uh, very good uh, celebrations happening down in La Cine afterwards. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think you had right. Um yeah, so obviously like the week before we're we're premiers. Yeah. Um but I think yeah. I think a few people we had, you know, we celebrated the success along the way, but we definitely had the following week in our heads of we're not done and mm. we're still not done. Um but obviously, yeah, bit of time, bit of breathing space. So I think we did just take a moment to yeah, get together and like I said, <laughs> headed to the sing, um, sang sang our hearts out. Um don't think there's as much singing talent as football talent in our team. <laughs> um and yeah. Everyone loves sober karaoke, right? Yep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. No. <laughs> um, did you get a, uh, a swig of that champagne afterwards as well? Because I did see, see that going around. Yeah, I think actually Mallory <laughs> might have, um, yeah, snagged most of that. But can't say there wasn't another bottle in the changing rooms. And um, yeah, I think uh, my dancing move might have uh, took over kind of getting a swig of that. <laughs> got a bit carried away <laughs> no it's good to see that celebration and do you reckon obviously you mentioned that the uh, you won the premiership the week prior mm. um and does now that you guys know that you won the premiership you got a few rounds to go before final series mm. kicks off is that what help you guys celebrate even more because you know all right we've got a couple more weeks to go we can at least let our hair go and just relax for this week and enjoy the uh, enjoy the ride um i guess so but i guess it's like a fine balance of you know, we're not done. And if you go into the next two games with not the same mindset we've had, there's, you know, you're not really champions. So yeah. even the next two weeks doesn't change the ladder position, but absolutely it's our momentum. It's our standards. It's our professionalism. It's what we all stand for as individuals. Um, but yeah, I guess just this week, you know, it just becomes more and more real that what is like, it was eight years since West Adelaide have won the yeah. cup. So real big, um, yeah, like just big things to celebrate. I think, I've always been quite a serious player. So um, at university, I don't want to, it's changing now, but a bit of university culture in the UK is a bit of maybe drinking attached to the sports societies. Uh, not so much with the team I was in. We, yeah, we're trying to change the culture of that. Yeah. But um, I kind of always hid in the background and was very yeah, focused, um, big fan of Rio Ferdinand and the way he talks about Manchester United in the glory days and yeah. how relentless you have to be. And they just... You know, it was one win after a win and you didn't take your eyes off. But I actually think, you know, if we look at it more holistically, you do have to celebrate these moments because they might not come around that often. I think especially with the pandemic it shows how quickly, you know, all the football you could play might just be taken away from you really quickly. So mm. it's important to celebrate um, and I think embrace the positives. But yeah, we're definitely, we're not done. And yeah, we might not have many vocals, but definitely <laughs> got the hunger still to... Keep going. Well, if you win the uh, the uh, the grand final, what will be your your uh, song of choice for the scene this time around? Um, well, I was I don't know again coming from England or whatever, but 
there's definitely some things we need to improve on in our celebration. So I think I tried to start the Freed from Desire song. So, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And just change a few limit lyrics yeah. like, you know, Wesley's on fire or Quiggs is on fire, Mel's on fire. And week one and the, with the premieres, um, when we were in the premieres, it didn't quite take off. And yep. everyone was like, what's, what's Liv doing over there? And then this week we got a bit better. So I think that's, you know, when we win the treble, we'll be in true sync with uh, <laughs> singing that or maybe a bit of ABBA will come back for... Tracy, she had that on, so we'll see. Yeah, nice. who knows? Send your song request in, and I'm sure we can uh, take some take some up on that. Nice. Or well, we'll definitely post those on the social media. <laughs> yeah. get those going Maybe around. once the travel is out the way, yeah, perhaps we'll share that with everyone. <laughs> well, talking about the cup, you won the WNPL WSL Cup, but the biggest cup on offer for footballers in the world is the World Cup, mm. and. It's going to be on our shores here in Australia next year in 2023. It's a big, uh, a big occasion for women's football. Mm. Um, we've seen it grow in uh, women's football grow um, over the last ten or so years, but in the last few years, we've seen a bit more of an increase because everyone's the excitement's building around this mm. World Cup coming here, um, and we're seeing extra teams going into the uh, A League Women, mm. which is fantastic. More opportunities there for women's footballers. But what do you think in your, uh, from a, a person that comes from the UK outside of Australia, what's um, an occasion like getting the World Cup here mean for women's football? Yeah, it's incredible. Like just what a fantastic opportunity. I think, like you said, the build up to an event like that, but even, you know, if you get it right and hopefully, you know, Australia or New Zealand will, but you can really create that legacy and inspire yeah. the girls. Like you just see it now. So from the Euros in England, and obviously the Lionesses absolutely stormed that tournament and it's on home soil and they've won. Yep. And you just see it now that even the way pundits talk and unfortunately, yes, there's still sexism around and there always probably will be, unfortunately. Um, but the way, you know, the seriousness in the game to showcase the talent, which there absolutely is. And when that's on a world stage, the audience you can sh share yeah. that with is incredible. And hopefully a lot of the young girls around the world but yeah in australia you can really see the potential that soccer can have for them um yeah. yeah let's hope let's hope so but they've obviously football south australia and i've spoken to uh, michelle smith the head of the referees about this because she's on the, i think she's on the legacy um board um and she um mentioned about the pillars there's a few pillars they have for the uh the legacy plan and one of them is infrastructure and you played in uh, one of those um, play, uh, one of the parts of the legacy, which is the Service FM Stadium, mm -hmm. the brand new state centre for football in South Australia. That is um, something that's come out of this World Cup campaign. Mm -hmm. What was it like to to play a place like that? That's um, that probably if it wasn't for the Women's World Cup and having a legacy plan, we wouldn't have something like that. Yeah, it's fantastic, and I think to have like you know, I don't want to say, but a grass pitch with you know stands is awesome. It creates that. Um, real good fan base and we can come and have the atmosphere and it does feel like you know playing a final in that environment is is special and it yeah. creates that special environment and it's just nice to have a hub for football as well I think Ve Velo Park almost was kind of had something similar but yeah not a stadium not yeah. a grass pitch you know not the, the facilities and the change room so it just adds to it and it yeah it adds to your the professionalism of the game and how you know, I'm a big preparer in terms of each game yep. and so having facilities like that um just really helps that and makes things a lot easier. What other things do you reckon you want to see come out of this opportunity of the World Cup coming to our shores? What would you love to see it do for local football as well on top of the um, the, the way people see women's football and also the infrastructure? Yeah, so I think firstly, yeah, just to showcase the talent and to real, really see that trickle-down effect. So I really hope that, yeah, the young girls and yep. can really be inspired if they don't participate already to participate and know what soccer's about. Because for me, like, it's changed my life. Like, it's everything what my life is about now. But when I first started playing, it was just, you know, like the friendships you get from soccer, um, the outlet and the things you learn around just playing the sport is, you know, invaluable. So I really hope, yeah, people that don't play do, but the girls that do, they have more opportunities to. So, and that comes down to coaches. So, you know, we need good coaches to teach and to have the appropriate training to do so. And yeah. that's, you know, consideration to the holistic side to it as well. Like how are we looking after our players and how are we f supporting the females along the way? Because there's lots of different, you know, um, I guess challenges, 
not just challenges, but the way female and men's football is, there was always going to be differences. Mm. Um, you know, so having people, personnel to support that journey, like you said, facilities, just places to play and times to play. Um, and yeah, just getting more people around it. Like who doesn't want to? talk about soccer and play soccer <laughs> oh, no, I know <laughs> who doesn't I don't I can't I don't play I'm terrible at playing soccer but I love watching and being involved in it and um, working within it so for me I can't wait for the World Cup mm. it's going to be a, a, so one good. of the best um, occasions in the in the, in Australian football we mm. had the uh, the men's um, Asian Cup here in 2015 um, unfortunately not in South Australia but we had an interstate and that was incredible and what it did for um, football in general here in Australia was incredible mm. but to have finally the World Cup and for the women's game as well which we I, I personally want to see it um, get, get to the next level and get even further and I think this is uh, the right way for it yeah absolutely it's you know we need to see it flourish because yeah. Like I said, there's a lot of talent and like I said, I don't want to always talk about the UK and Europe, but you do see how the changes at the top end do make a difference. And, yep. you know, we look at the Euros for the Lionesses and the England women. The last time, you know, the men won it, the in women were banned from playing. Like that's yes. that's barbaric. Like, and now they're the ones, you know, bringing it home. Um, and I don't mean to just be, yeah, strict binary or just talk about you know, men versus women, because it's got to be everyone, you yeah. know, we've all got to be whatever person you are, whatever gender, whatever sex, like we need to just create more equal opportunities for everybody. Um, yeah. And if soccer can be that tool to do that, <clears throat> it absolutely should be. And yeah, there's, there's the, the, the women at the top of the game deserve more credit for what they've overcome, but the talent they display. And then like I said, filtering down, even at MPO level, bridging that gap between, yeah, the resources and the recognition and the support, the, men and women can get absolutely to be yeah brought together a bit more absolutely it definitely does and um there's, there's still a long way to go but what areas do you think that need to be tackled first in um in australian football in general to get to a better a better area for women's football because there's a massive gap and you can see it still mm. with the way it is because obviously fiona watts she was um you wouldn't see any a-league men player who was in her case playing for A-League Women's, made the finals, had an incredible season, but on the side, she had to do a, um, another job at working at McDonald's. Yeah, um, <laughs> absolutely. Like, so I'm doing a PhD now. There's some people in my research office that actually do women in sport research, and they spoke to Fiona about that. And at the time, I, well, where I live now is where Fiona, we, we were housemates as well. So yeah, I just found it crazy when I'd see Fee go off in a car to a McDonald's shift. And, <laughs> you know, she's all time that year, like top goal scorer for the A-League. Like, yeah. that's ridiculous. And, the fact that she can perform at that level with still juggling all these things outside of um, outside of the, like playing is incredible and like also credits her. But imagine what you do when you say to Fiona, you can be full time and you give her, I don't want to just say about money because, you know, money doesn't grow on trees essentially. So we need to find better ways to fund the game. Um, and that, again, things like the World Cup, but it comes from the exposure, um, potentially some broadcasting, um and having better people invest in it and yeah like sponsorship and but it's got to be like a whole round thing you can't just pick one thing and say oh this is going to happen and it's going to change the game we've yeah. got to look at all the different areas but i think yeah professionalizing the game will help because even from my point of view like trying to go from mpl to a league you know i've got three part-time jobs at the moment I'm doing a phd um and then playing mpl so even at MPL level to see more funding in that sense to just take some of them external pressures off and really allow the talent to come through and flourish would I think just helps massively. Yeah, three three jobs, <laughs> three jobs a and a PhD life with me. and yeah, football. Trust me, yeah. So um, how do you juggle? What actually go through? What three three jobs do you have? Yeah, so my so I obviously do my PhD and then I do research assistant work. Yep. Um, I do teaching at Flinders Uni at the moment. Okay. And then strength conditioning um, at Prince Alfred College for the rowing program. So wow, juggling all that and then yeah, just trying to obviously do other things like support sponsors in a way because I'm trying to you know innovate ways where I can. Then I work with Pega Grip Socks for example. Like okay, what can I give back to Pega or. Um, I train at Chroma Strength Conditioning. So I just help with a bit of the like the marketing there. Just, you know, like you just have to be because yep. that's the only way I'm going to be able to get by with those resources is if I give back. But yeah, sometimes you, you're giving from here, here, here and here. And then there's like, well, what's left of me to play football? Yeah. 
Um, but luckily, the love of the game, and especially when you're in a team like West Adelaide, with the support um, from, like I said, the girls themselves and Tracy, Kirsty, Rachel, all the behind the scenes people at the club, it makes it a lot easier. But it's not always that straightforward, unfortunately. So that's um, that's incredible how you manage to do all that in the, and still play football and play at your best as well. Yeah. How many nights a week do you train for with West Adelaide? Um, so two to three, depending yep. what days our game fall on. Um, but then I also do my own external training. So like I said, at the gym, but I also work with um, Roger Williamson, so um, RWFT, um, and do a one-to-one yep. training. So I'll do an additional two or three sessions and then maybe take yeah the soccer ball down to the pitch on my own because, again, you just can't afford all the time to... Yep. Yep pay for all these extra sessions all the time. <laughs> so what is uh, the training at the RWFT? What's that like um, for yourself personally doing it with them? Oh, I love it. Um, yeah, so Roger runs that and he is a fantastic coach. Like he really understands me as a footballer, I think, and to have someone like that, probably one of a reason why I was so like, excited to come back to South Australia from Victoria. Um, I had an injury in pre-season, so coming back from that was a little bit yeah. challenging. Um, so being able to work with Roger and him drive my standards was awesome. And um, he trains a couple of the senior men as well yep. uh, around SA. So not just West Adelaide players all across the board. So I train with a couple of the boys as well, which um, I love because I just learn from them and um, yeah, keep up the intensity, a bit more high tempo and it's fantastic. Yeah, That's fantastic to see. Um, and just a quick insight into Fiona Watts as well. Mm. Someone like that, you'd expect her to be exhausted from working all that time at McDonald's. It's a high-pressure job working in McDonald's. Yeah. Um, trying to get out, pump out those yeah. uh, cheeseburgers. It's fast food and, for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so for her to be able to do that and also football uh, training with Adelaide United because it'll be more than two, three times a week mm-hmm. they train, even though they're only part-time footballers, mm-hmm. they do still train like full-timers. Um, what was it like? Out, what was she like outside of um, the, the training and work life? Um, how was she with that? Yeah, I think Fee probably still managed to get a few naps in here and there, but she's full of energy. And I think, um, I guess like most of the female footballers that are there, like the love of the game drives you and she's an incredibly talented person, but she definitely has, yeah, the ambition and the passion there to back that up. Um, I think she was pretty dedicated in the UK. Like I said, she moved up north for university, but was travelling two hours to play for Leicester women at the time. So you just do these things as a a female footballer. You you almost don't second you question yourself you just you just get on with it and I think yeah looking at players like Fee that have made that step up and you know not necessarily the first year but a second year at Adelaide United like I can't even name all the awards she got like Mm. incredible to be able to do that on the lifestyle she was living but like I said hopefully she felt like she had a good support network from her friends and um I think that's about it and just yeah credit to her really yeah, no, nah, it's it's good to see. I I can't wait for the 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 moment where the A League women is at a point where it can be um full time, just like the men, and also the similar um opportunities as well, which would be fantastic. Yeah, definitely. So in I'd say the closest I've ever played to kind of full time training was when I was at university. So in England, you can play for your university league, so it's more structured than just like it is here and then you play for your club still so I was playing games on a Wednesday and a Sunday every week and I'd train Monday Tuesday Thursday Friday and I'd just have Saturday off yep. and then some morning sessions so yeah like more than what eight trainings a week plus and then S&C on top of that two games and it's just fantastic like the way you play and yeah you just thrive in them environments well I, don't, I definitely did and I loved yeah. it and so to see that then actually happen be able to happen you know, when you get into your adult life and you don't have something like university structures, that would just be incredible because mm. that's where players really take off. Yeah, nice. Well, um, hopefully, like I said, I've said it heaps of times, well, I do want to see that get to a point where it's uh, equal on both sides because football in general is a great sport. And mm. it, to have the women's game where it is now, it's, it's a lot better than what it was. Um, yeah. And uh, hopefully we can see it a bit more. And World Cup coming around, obviously you will want to see England um England play yeah the European champions at the moment they've got to play USA in a couple of months time at Wembley again but yeah I want to see the Lionesses come and take the world stage as well but that doesn't mean I won't get behind some of the the Aussie girls and um yeah maybe wear half and half shirt or (laughs) we'll see (laughs) your family the half and half shirt because I've brought it up about doing it for a cup final and stuff and people gave me a little bit of heat for it (laughs) <laughs> Maybe like an 80-20. <laughs> um, no, yeah, I, 
maybe yeah an, an England Australia final won't be too yeah, bad and nice. be interesting to see what Sam Kerr can pull out the bag for the Aussies but um, we'll see what exciting times it's going to be good and uh, have you ever been to something like this before a cup final uh, or like the World Cup or any other like maybe Euros yeah so I went to the Euros when it was in France so yeah. I drove from where I'm from in Leicester so the East Midlands just took my Nissan Micra um, just didn't have any AC or anything it was about 10 years old little <laughs> Gold bubble car, drove to London, got on the ferry, drove through Calais to Paris for 48 hours, watched um, Sweden versus... God, it's bad that I can't remember, isn't it? Uh, watched Sweden play somebody else um, <laughs> at a stadium and then, yeah, drove back and I think my couple of friends in the back uh, probably melted away during that time <laughs> driving through Calais. But yeah. How far is the drive from um, London to France? Oh, I don't know. What, it's like four hours... Um, three four hours to get to dover so where you get the ferry yep hour and a half ferry four hours on the other side so yeah it's a 10 hour drive i guess and that's not too bad it's like driving that's like <laughs> driving from here to melbourne from yeah melbourne. considering i'd be in a different continent back home <laughs> yeah. not too bad yeah. driving yeah. that's not bad because here you drive from one state to the other and there you're driving through multiple countries <laughs> yeah absolutely i get yeah from yeah england to france in less than a day so well you should you should bad. be fine then when the world cup comes around you can drive oh, to each, each state each game go yeah. around yeah you're um, used to it yeah <laughs> As long as you've got aircon, that's all that matters. Yeah, I was going to say, I'd probably need to, one, get myself a car and two, um, yeah, get some a car with AC. <laughs> nice. Well, um, thank you. I've been I've enjoyed chatting to you about the UK, the women's football, because you seem very, very passionate about the game and hopefully um, about it getting to the next level where it mm. deserves to be. And uh, the World Cup, I'm, I'm sure the World Cup's going to be only positive for the game here in South Australia. Um, but before I let you go, what do you really want to see um happen in australia australian uh, women's football well first i definitely want the hellas to uh <laughs> win the treble <laughs> no, I'm um yeah like i said more opportunities across each state i'd really like to see the states level out you know for the girls that can't just up their lives because of jobs and stuff like that mm. and they don't want to go and play in new south wales to have sa itself flourish wa and those players really you know attract the talent from around the world um, I think there's definitely probably some limitations with, you know, internationals coming and going as well. Um, so, inter- you know, some like, you know, Sam Kerr and goes yeah. overseas. But if we can keep that talent here and really make it thrive here, that would be awesome. And, you know, as me as an international player, breaking in's hard. There's always visa spots available, um, but a little bit more competitions, never any harm. But yeah, potentially just that. Yeah. Trying to break down the barriers for everybody, really. And then... In- on a personal level and also a club level, where would you like to see West Adelaide and yourself go in the future as well? Yeah, so obviously like the treble. Yeah, <laughs> obviously the treble this year, but I think for them to continue, yep. um, to continue to build that legacy, and there's a lot of stuff we do outside the football as well in the community sense. So building on from that and working on those relationships, um, I think driving the club forward. Like we have great sponsors at Sport, and Harry's a big sponsor of ours. So for Distinctive Homes, so more people like that investing in the women's game and sharing that passion yep. and growing it from upwards. And then, yeah, for myself, making a step up, like I said, my eyes are on the A-League. It's a little bit harder being an international player when there's three, four spots. And, mm. you know, when I'm Fiona Watts is one of them um, visa spots, I'm, I've got a lot of work to do to <laughs> be at that talent. Um, but that's where I want to be. And whether that's interstate or SA or Adelaide, who knows, but... We'll see what the future holds. Hopefully. Well, there's a few more clubs popping up in the A-League yeah. Women, which is fantastic. So it means there's an, an extra um, or 20 plus uh, players available for each team. So hopefully there's a spot there for you. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> well, I'd like to think so. So just a bit more hard work and kind of got the mindset that, yeah, I'm there, I'm ready and I'll yep. outwork anyone even <laughs> if my feet don't really, yeah, um, aren't as good as someone else, so... No, well, hof- hopefully you get there. But before I let you go, the final <laughs> final thing I need to do is the kick in the questions. I ask every guest about this. Okay, nice. I'm not sure if you've uh, you're uh, across this or not. Okay. No, I'm no, not, yeah, I like that. Oh. I like when when someone's <laughs> not prepared. <laughs> now, so the kick in the questions, uh, just a bit of fun to finish it all off. But um, who would you love to kick it with on the park? Anyone in the world? Who? Hey, oh my gosh, good question. Oh, this is too. Can, okay, so I'm gonna say Rio Ferdinand. Oh yeah. I'm probably obsessed with him um, from afar. Obviously, I've never actually met him. So that's like my celebrity male. Um, I'd probably say in the women's game, maybe like Millie Bright. Yeah. Um, Leah Williamson, again, Lionesses, 
centre backs, big idols. Um, and then locally, the girls I do at training, like yeah. I get to kick it with Rachel Quigley, like <laughs> hero. So and Mel and everyone. So I think I'm already kicking it with the girls I want to be actually. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, the next one you're gonna love it as well because I think those girls and you've already done it with them as well. You've already done this with Quigley. But who would you love to kick it with on a Saturday night, watching football and uh, even go out for a couple of drinks and let's sing as well. Oh, so who do I want to carry? <laughs> <laughs> Get oh gosh, whoa. One locally, one international. Definitely heard uh, Nicole Tilly rapping some Eminem that yes. I wouldn't mind seeing again. Oh, she's, yeah. She's singing Eminem, does she? Yeah, Rap you should Eminem. probably get her to do that next time she's on this, actually. <laughs> I've already had it. I might just get her to send it in so I can yeah. uh, um, put it up. <laughs> so if I wouldn't mind Tracy as well, I saw some ABBA creeping out of her. So maybe we'll see when the trouble what Tracy comes back with. But And then internationally, oh, I'd say my best pal, you know. Yeah, Charlotte Steggs, Steggles, um, she's my best friend from home. She's like my person. Yeah. Um, so to have her over here in the sing, she loves Adele, so. Okay. I'd love to have her over here playing alongside me, but she's on to bigger and better things. So, so you got the West Al- your best friend from UK and also the uh, the West LA girls as well. Yeah, yeah. Captain at Westies and then the others can be back in singers. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So a lot of fun um, down there and I'm sure you guys... Uh, would be a lot of fun that down at Lasing. Hopefully, um, I'll join po- us yeah, next time. Yeah. yeah, come and join you after the uh, the grand gonna final. There's definitely going to be more celebrations. Yeah, we can't. We're not going to let this one escape. So it looks it's like a fun group to, to be involved in because um, the way you guys celebrate. I saw actually, I think I saw your dance moves <laughs> on the field after the play. Yeah, um, they get even worse behind <laughs> scenes. So if you, yeah, next time you can come in and see the behind the scenes footage. <laughs> I'll get the. Um, I'll make sure they uh, have the cameras on you for the uh, the, the grand final as well. Oh just yeah. In case. I think- um, Rachel's partner Kelsey, she was in our change room as well, so she definitely captured some moments. But I'm hoping they just stay stay for our eyes only. So, yeah. uh, well, I might have to get my hands on that, I reckon. <laughs> but um, no, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks it's been a pleasure me. talking to you about the uh, your career, but also your journey and also the uh, women's game as well, because it's it's a great insight to the uh, the women's game in the in Australia, the world, and in your mm. perspective as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. It's been so fun talking to you, and um, yeah, hope. Whoever listens to this really enjoyed it too. And if there's any guys out there that are thinking of playing or wanting to play, just get involved, get stuck in and just give it a go. Like, you know, what's the worst that's going to happen? That's it. It's <laughs> um, it's a great sport to be involved in and the World Cup's next year as well. So just get out and watch it. And that's if that doesn't make you uh, play, then nothing will. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Might as well, yeah. Just take up something else. <laughs> crushing that's it well thank you so much for joining me and uh, it's great to have someone with the, the same name as an apple yeah thanks go apple <laughs> <laughs> that was West Adelaide's WNPL player Olivia Bramley make sure you subscribe to Kicking It Local wherever you get your podcast so you can get a taste of the SA football community plus follow at Kicking It Local SA on Instagram and Twitter so you don't miss any of the action See you soon.